you've seen the movie, you know the story in here. If you've not, let me give you the brief summary of it. Is um, Tom Hanks is playing a character by the name of Chuck Nolan, a federal express an executive for FedEx. He spends approximately four or five years marooned on a desert island somewhere in the Pacific Ocean. He comes back and he is rescued and he realizes in that time frame he has lost the woman that he loves. He has lost his connection to his job. He has lost his connection to anything in the world that he knows. And at the very end of the movie here, which you see, he's standing literally at a crossroads. Trying to decide where his life is going to go. And as I was reading this lesson and studying these lessons, this popped into my head because this is exactly what this lesson's about today. Israel's at a crossroads. Remember from last week, Pastor John led us in, and this chosen people of God, this blessed nation, these sons of Abraham, this unique people in the eyes of God had decided that they're going to forsake all that. And they wanted to be like all the other nations. They wanted a king like all the other nations. And now with that decision, they stand at a crossroads. Just like we stand at a crossroads. It's the same crossroads that we stand at as what Israel stood at, as what the kings stood at. And it's simply this. Are we going to live our lives to make ourselves look good, or are we going to live our lives to make God look good? That's the question. Are we going to live our lives to make God look good? Our story picks up exactly right after last week's sermon, is last week's lesson, as they decided they wanted a king, and Saul... Samuel, the prophet, the leader of the people, he goes out and he selects Saul. Saul is the one who is chosen by God to be the first king to lead the people. Remember in grade school? Remember in grade school or junior high when they decided they were going to play a team sport or either soccer or baseball or kickball or whatever it was, right? They are going to play a team sport. And the teacher would always come in and say, okay, you're a captain and you're a captain, right? And you get the first pick. Ever notice how it was always the same kid who got picked first? Right? My school was a kid by the name of Mike Loggins. Always first. Mike Loggins was about this much taller than anybody else in the class. He was big, he was strong, he was always first. It didn't matter what sport we were playing, what we were doing, he was always first, right? That's Saul. Saul walks in here and Saul is big, he is strong, he is tall, he comes from the right family, his father's a respected elder of the people, he comes from the right town, he comes from the right side of the tracks. Everybody takes one look at Saul and goes, wow, isn't he a king? He's got the look, he's got everything about him, he's the king. he starts off good. You must understand it. Saul does some great things for the people. He wins lots of battles. We've seen going through as Israel has had lots of wars and lots of battles. He wins lots of battles. He brings a measure of peace to people, his nation. He has the brains to send David out to fight Goliath. He has the brains to put David as the head of his army. And everything is going great. Everything is going beautiful with Saul. And then things start to come off the tracks. The wheels start to fly off. They go out to this war. They have another, yet one another wars, battles, and they go out to this battle, and Yahweh gives some specific instructions on how to conduct this battle. Samuel says, we're not going to do it that way, we're going to do it my way. And there's now yet another battle going in, and Samuel tells Saul, is that what Yahweh's saying here, you need to wait, 
You need to wait for me. Get your army ready. Get ready to go to battle, but you need to wait for me. Don't do anything until I get there, because I'm going to get there. I need to make a sacrifice before you go in. I've got to do it. You wait. Saul gets his army in there. He gathers them in camp. He gets around. He's waiting. He's waiting. He's waiting. He's waiting. He's beginning to worry that he's not looking good in the eyes of his people, and he goes out and makes the sacrifice. Saul's life comes off the tracks when he starts worrying about how he's looking. Saul starts living his life to make his own life look good, to make him look good. And it starts coming off the tracks. There's this thing with David and this jealousy and trying to kill David and the stories that with David and descends into virtual, almost virtual madness in here going in and it ends after a horrible defeat Saul takes his own life because Saul was trying to make Saul look good and so you enter the next king enter David remember in that story in about junior high you know the picking of the teams there's always the same kid who was picked first no matter what it was right Remember the other end of the scale? There was always the same two kids that were last being picked. Right? It didn't matter what sport you were doing or what. There was always the same two kids that were last being picked. That was me, by the way. Thank you. That's David. David's not a warrior. He's not a commander. David is this short, red-headed kid who is a poet and a singer, and a shepherd. Now you're thinking redhead, right? Yeah, okay. It's ready. Go look it up. He's redhead. David was a redhead, yes. And David's status was such in here is that Samuel, Yahweh sent Samuel, he said, go to Bethlehem and go to Jesse's house because one of Jesse's sons is going to be the king. That's who I've chosen. So Samuel goes down and says to Jesse, bring your sons before me. And he's got eight sons, but he brings the first seven in here, and the first son walks by, and the first son's kind of like Saul. First son is this big kid. Head and shoulders taller than everybody else. And Samuel goes, yeah, that's the king. He just looks like a king. And Yahweh goes, nope, not yet. And they go through all the other six sons and comes in and pulls all the first seven sons by, and Yahweh keeps saying, no, 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 no. And Samuel looks to Jesse and says, is that all your sons? And Jesse goes, yep. And Samuel goes, really? He pauses and he goes, oh, David, wait a second. Now there's a whole other sermon right here. Is that God chooses the unexpected. We have our expectations of how God's going to do things and who God's going to use. And God, and it's, and God has, chooses the unexpected and the unexplained and chooses the, what seems strange to us. There's this whole other sermon stuck in here that we could do right at this point. But we have a service at 1035. But David comes back and David is chosen as king and he does some great stuff. David is a giant among giants. He defeats Goliath. He wins many victories. He establishes a system of government and organization that works for the people, that brings the people order and brings the people peace. The temple of God where the people worship Yahweh is called the tabernacle. The tabernacle has been floating around wherever you can find it for 500 years and finally David says wait a second we've got to bring it to Jerusalem and he brings this tabernacle to the Jeru to Jerusalem everything he says great David man you're doing some great stuff in here my confirmation class was studying this very lesson this very lesson about David and we were going through the good things that David did and the bad things that David did, right, Kennedy? Right in here. Going through the good things that David did, the bad things that David did. And one of the students in the class said, David's life was a train wreck. 
And I go, yeah, good job. Listen to Pastor John, put one thing in another thing. Yeah, good job. One of the other kids in the class said, David's life wasn't a train wreck. David's life was a toxic train wreck. And we all sit there and says, well, what do you mean? And says, well, what happens with a train wreck, right? With a train wreck, you got a mess, right? What happens when you have a train that's carrying toxic chemicals wrecks? David's life is a toxic train wreck. There's this little thing with David and Bathsheba, adultery and murder. David's kids give a new meaning to the word dysfunctional. There's rape and there's murder among his kids. And David sits there and David does some monumentally stupid things that bring down, brings down the wrath and the ire of God upon him and his people. But what's the difference? What's the difference between Saul and David? Both did good things. Both were foul-ups. Both made some royal mistakes going in. If you look closely, Saul made some big mistakes. If you look closely, a little closer in here, David's mistakes were huge. They're monumentally huge. But Saul ends his life, and the scripture has Saul as one of the worst kings that existed. He's condemned as one of the worst kings that went on. And despite all the bad stuff that David did, Acts chapter 13, the book of Acts, remember, was written and spoken, took place some thousand years later. The book of Acts. In the book of Acts, David is, is described by Paul as saying, a man after God's own heart. And so the different question becomes, what's the difference? David lived his life in such a way to make God look good. He lived his life in such a way to make God look good. That's the question for our lives. Are we living our lives to make God look good? In the midst of the mess we have in our lives, in the midst of the train wrecks that we have in our life, in the midst of the mess that we have in going in that's our life, are, making, are we looking at excuses? Are we making excuses or reasons or looking for justifications on why this thing happened or why in here? Are we trying to justify ourselves and make ourselves look better? Are we falling down on our face and falling down on our knees in front of God and admitting that we're a mess? We're a mess, God, and need your forgiveness. We're a mess, God, and you're the only one that can save us. You're a, I'm a mess, God, and you're the one who's got to do this. I can't do this, God. We're living our lives in such a way to make God look good or ourselves look good. A couple weeks ago, I was talking to a friend of mine from Texas, a lay person in a congregation. The congregation made a conscious decision to begin to reach the lost. And over the, it had been taking place over a couple of years, and the congregation had made some significant changes and things in here. And he, he, he came, called me up and we talked and he said, you know, Pastor Mark, in here, I don't know what's going on. I don't know how to process this anymore. You know that little thing about being, you know, out of your comfort zone in here, into the out of comfort zone spot? He said, I'm about way over here. If this is comfort zone and this is out of comfort zone, I'm like over here. I don't know how to process this anymore. I don't know what's going on. I don't understand in here. We're in a brave new world, and I don't know how to react. And I sat and I said to him, live so that God looks good. Simply live to make God look good. Don't worry about it. Because that's what we're here for. That's what we're here for as a people. That's what we're here for as a body of Christ. That's what we're here and call it. God brings us together is to make God look good. Make God look good in whatever we do. Sometimes we're going to get stuff. It's the easy stuff to do. Make God look good. And sometimes we're going to get astronomically large things that are handed to us. To make God look good. See, there's this, there's this thing in here is we need to understand as we're feeling overwhelmed, we're feeling out of our comfort zone, we need to understand in here, God's not going to give you stuff that he knows that 
get this right and stumble over the first story, right? God's not going to give you something to do that you know you can do. Got it? God's not going to give you something to do that you know you can do. He's going to give you something to do he knows that you can't do. Because that's when he gets the glory. That's when he gets the glory. And our lives are to be about him getting the glory, not us. Not us sitting trying to justify ourselves. It's not about us. I'm a good person. But Jesus was the good person. And Jesus lived to make his father look good. That was the basic point of his life. He lived to make him, his father look good. When there's temptation in the wilderness. Remember the two out in the wilderness and there was one on the temple. One of them was he was to turn bread, two rocks into bread. And the other, the other temptation was jump off the temple. Jesus says, no, I'm not living to make me look good. This would be easy. It's, it's breeze. This is simple stuff. No. Jesus says, I'm going to make, we're here to make God, my father, look good. When Jesus does miracles and he does some really cool miracles, he he heals the sick. He, ra- he heals the sick. He makes lepers walk. He cures leprosy. He raises the dead for heaven's sakes. One guy who's been dead four days. But it's not just simply doing miracles to do miracles and to show off. It's to make his father look good. In the parables that he tells, he doesn't just tell parables to be a cute storyteller. It's to make his father look good in the story of the parable of the prodigal son which, by the way, is the worst name of a story in the Bible, because it has nothing it does with the story, with the sons, but it's not about the sons. It's a story that makes the father look good. The father in the story look good. It's a sto- story that makes the heavenly father look good. When Jesus is sitting there at the Garden of Gethsemane, and he knows what's going to happen in a few hours. He knows... In a few hours, the horror and the pain that's going to take place. He knows and beginning to feel the weight of the sins of the entire world upon him. He sits there in the garden and prays, Not my will, but your will be done. He lives his life to make his father look good for us to make his father look good that we'd realize that the father is good that God is good and that God loves us and that's who he is and that's who we trust in and that's who we live with that's the faith that we have is sitting there realizing that yes God is good and our job is to make God look good to show what he already is. So as we sit and we go through life, are we living to make God look good? As we go through the train wrecks in our lives, as we go through the mess of our lives and the things keep coming apart at the seams, are we living in such a way to make ourselves look good or are we living to make God look good? As we're faced with the stuff we don't understand, we're out of our comfort zone. When we're sitting there and we can't grasp and understand this brave new world, are we simply striving to let make God look good? As we stand at those crossroads of life, the same crossroads that the people of Israel stood at, the same crossroads that the king stood at, the same crossroads that we stand at every day, Are we living to make God look good? Amen. Bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, you are good. That's who you are. And we bless you and praise your name because you are good. Help us to live that way. Help us to live and simply live and show it in everything that we say and do. Amen.